Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 55th episode of Stories of Service, Ordinary People Who Do Extraordinary Work. And I am the host of Stories of Service, Teresa Carpenter. And today uh, we have another amazing guest. And I always love it when we have people that are not only just amazing people in the healing and the trauma-informed care space, but also people that I know personally and are friends of mine. So I want to give a very, very warm welcome to Miss Nancy Harity. Nancy, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on your show, Teresa. Awesome. So what I uh, is normally, as you guys know, I, I start off by reading uh, the bio for our guest, and then we go into some questions about the service. I have another guest who has served in the United States military, and I always love it when I can talk about someone's uh, service, not only to others, but service to our great nation. So as I said, uh, Nancy has helped me tremendously. She's helped me make sense of my past and how for years I let that narrative and the story that I was telling myself uh, control my present and even control my future. And Nancy, what she does is she helps people unlock what's holding them back so they can move forward stronger. Um, like me, she's had a difficult relationship with a primary caregiver. And as we all know, uh, these early childhood experiences shape the course of our lives. And until we fully own our past and process those relationships in a healthy fashion, we never transform into the person we aspire to be. And as I said in the show notes, uh, if you read them earlier, along that same line, if we've had traumatic experiences in the workplace, but we bury those scars, we are destined to repeat them unless we fully understand why it happened and what lessons we can take away from those experiences. So Nancy Harity has spent the past 30 years sharing stories for government agencies and corporations with international, national, and local media, as well as with financial and industry analysts and other influencers. These stories landed customers, enhanced stock prices, garnered cooperation from partners and celebrated and guided employees. After burning out twice, she learned that unhealed hurts and hidden triggers drive behavior and that the stories we tell ourselves are far more important than any story we tell anyone else. Through her company, What If Transformation LLC, Ms. Harity shares the powerful tools she used to diffuse her triggers and change her story to help change makers diffuse their hidden emotional triggers and become better leaders by changing the stories they tell themselves and others. Welcome. Thank you. So the first question, I, like I say, I always ask my guests, uh, those of us who've served in the United States military is, where are you from and what made you decide to join the Navy? Well, I am from Lombard, Illinois, which is a Western suburb of Chicago. And hey, you know what? It was the early nineties and money to come by for school was hard. You know, Pell Grants, poof, gone. Parents didn't want to contribute, didn't feel able to contribute to my education. And well, 30 years hence, I can tell you, I'm glad that they put that money into their retirement instead of into me. Um, but it was it was a great way to, to get money for college. And this was before Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And we started our Middle East adventures as a country. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was a time the Cold War was over, seemed like a relatively safe and easy thing to do. Great way to get some money for college, see the world and and learn something about myself in the process. So that's why I joined, figured, well, maybe I'll stay my five years and, you know, we'll reevaluate then. And at the time, I really wanted to get my degree. So I said adios to uh, active duty and joined the reserves. So when you joined as a... Yeah, uh, in the military on active duty, you were enlisted. Um, were you an MC? Well, I was a journalist. This You're was a journalist. Or yeah. there were MCs. So mm -hmm. that meant I learned a whole lot about writing and a little bit about photography and a little bit about layout and design and some about public affairs. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was like I, I told the recruiter I wanted to do marketing. Mm -hmm. he pulls this card out of his box because this was before they had everything. You know, this was before internet. Hey, well, what about this? Yeah, it sounds awesome. Oh, wait, I can't get you a seat. Well, why tease me like that? Seriously. Mm. Wow. Yeah, yeah. They, I, I was not a fan favorite at the recruiting office because uh, they were trying to get me into all these other things that I didn't really want to do. And finally, they had to bump me up to somebody else. And oh, they finally got me a seat in the school a year later. And I'm like, mm, yeah, mm, no, because did you know, you just can't go to maps and take the ASVAB and like window shop. 
Right, right. No, you really can't. No, you really can't. And, and the funny thing, they thought that that would cinch it for me was like, well, you know, you can be on TV if you're a journalist. So what? Not everybody wants to be on TV. Right. You know? I, but any rate, I digress. It was fun. And I learned a lot. And I did get to see the world. Yep. And you became, a, anyway. yeah, you became a professional communicator. And I think mm -hmm. that journey and then going into the reserves and then continuing as a professional communicator, it's sort of, I think, would you say that it laid the foundation to the work that you're doing today? Well, in a lot of respects, yes, because to be a communicator, you have to get inside people's heads. You have to understand what motivates them. You have to understand what attracts them to, to products and information. Um, you have to understand how to structure a story and tell a story and why that's important. Uh, and, and, and then you get to do all of that. Now, in my case, all of that led eventually to me working at the Navy's public affairs headquarters, where I was the point person for policy and doctrine, which is basically the rules of the road of how to do communication in the Navy. And I was the Navy's representative across DOD and interagency uh, working groups where we talked about these things and figured them out including one on an interesting topic known as information as a joint function. And this was where they decided, okay, for the joint world, we have these domains that we fight wars in, land, sea, air. Um, and they finally realized that, yeah, information is a, a war fighting space too. And so they will bring all the, the people who touched on information together. Right these fantastic discussions. One of my favorites was they brought all these people together because the guys who were writing the doctrine on this, they thought there was only one definition for information. So we ended up in this meeting and it was like 50 people and they got 50 different answers about what information is, because depending on where you sit, that that's how you view it. You know, so information's currency, information, is something that's processed information, something that, that's not processed. It, it's it's ones and zeros. It all depends on, on what you do and how you view the world. So that that was a, an interesting learning and, and a, a, a great reminder that even when you are telling a story, even when you are communicating with others, just because you think that you're talking about something that's going to make sense to everybody, it's not necessarily going to make sense to everybody else because we all come to our, to the world in, into our work with different filters based on our experiences, our education, the, the things that we do that colors that. And mm -hmm. it was fascinating. And, and a, after that initial conversation where we learned that we had a much more complex task in, in defining the space than any of us had originally thought, the, um, some folks at the, uh, within DOT, they would bring in these, these fantastic speakers who taught us about all different kinds of things from different perspectives, storytelling, how the brain actually works, what motivates people. And, and it was fascinating. Um, the, the science has just advanced so much from when I first got my undergraduate degree. And then when I got my MBA, you know, where we were taught certain things about how to motivate people and how to lead people and, and what makes people tick. And I've come to learn, well, that stuff's interesting for sure. Mm -hmm. And sometimes right. it's even true. But most of the time, you have no idea what is driving somebody. And that dovetailed into a personal journey of mine where I really, I've been into personal growth and finding better, newer ways to do things since I was a teenager. And that kind of dovetailed into that because as, as I matured as a professional, I started realizing, why am I doing the things I do? I know better than to do X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. but yet I do it anyway. And I can't help myself. Why? What, 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 how, how does that work? Right. And, and so that, that was a, a side off duty pursuit of mine where I, I was trying to better understand that for myself. And that led me to study hypnosis. 
and to study trauma and to study emotions. And that's all this stuff that we don't want to talk about at work because it's messy. Mm -mm. Nobody wants to talk about it. Oh, gosh. I, well, I, I, I can't be angry at work. No, I can't be happy at work. Well, that's OK, but not too much happy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, and, and everything else, all that stuff that we just want people to check at the door when they walk into the office. Mm -hmm. That's not how people work. No, it, 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 it's ridiculous. And, and, and so now I'm, I'm, I'm melding what I've learned in both worlds into to something singular that I call Heal the Leader, where I, I really believe that all this stuff that I was taught as a business administration manager, as an MBA student, as military leader, like I said, interesting, but doesn't really delve into how you how to motivate people, how to help people. And here we are, we go. Absolutely, and Nancy. And I go ahead, Teresa. You still there? All I'm right. Still there. Yeah. So we may be having just for. This live uh, folk Virginia. And I think uh, Nancy here is she's, she's from DC. And so storm on her end. So just bear with us as we may be a little bit in and out uh, as, but we'll get. So are you still there, Nancy? I am. Awesome. So what really spoke to me as you're, as you're describing this is the fact that we do the same things and we repeat the same patterns over and over again, even if we don't want to. I did that with my relationships. I would mm -hmm. naturally gravitate toward unhealthy and who weren't good for me, whether that be a friend or whether that be a significant other. Understand how to choose better partners or how to surround my. Lost me again. Oh, there we go. I didn't know how to surround myself with more emotionally stable people. Mm. I think that that those habits, they form very, am I correct about that? Oh, well, you cut out a bit, but I think your question was these, these habits, these patterns, they form when we're relatively young. And mm -hmm. it's true. Right? I mean, look, if you're a parent, you know, children are sponges. They are always listening. They are always picking up stuff. It's not always what you want them to pick up though. And while when we're born and we come into this 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 world we know unabashedly that we are awesome and we don't have any problems with confidence we just have communication problems because we can't talk all we can do is coo and cry and mm -hmm. you know depending on on the response we got from our caregivers when we were cooing and crying um that affirmed our our thought that we're awesome or it confirmed that we have to be somebody who we're not to get attention, to fit in, to, to survive in this world. And th those patterns that we develop to cope as, as, as very young children, it, it could be from infancy, it could be, you know, in, in, until we're a little bit older too. Um, but th those strategies that we employed to get our needs met back then, we carry that into adulthood. And we're not we conscious do. that we're doing it. No. And Great. guess what? We don't check those 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 tendencies at the door when we when we make it to work each day. Right. So yep, absolutely. So so it, it it's challenging. And as as leaders, we're not taught to recognize that. And as individuals, yeah. we're not taught to recognize that. And and it it's it ends up um being very detrimental to us because we find ourselves, like Teresa said, in, in patterns where it's like, I know better. You know, Teresa, you, you, you had a habit of, of picking the not best people to hang with. Me, I know to exercise. I know how to eat healthfully. I've done it at different points in my life. Yeah, but you know what? Hey, Nan. Hmm, did I cut out again? Teresa.
Teresa. You're stuck. Okay. Well, it looks like Teresa got stuck and maybe bounced out. Anyway, as I was saying, so we, we have these patterns. We're looking forward. We know what we want to do. We know we want to make the right choices. But there you are. You're, Hi, you're, there I am. There you are. Hi, guys. Hi. Yep. Nancy doesn't cut it out, but Teresa has. So, guys, what I'll do for the part that I upload later, uh, I will uh, cut that part out so that no one else has to re-listen to that. But uh, apologize. And I think the part that I I, I uh, left off with you was, you know, as a child, when you're hearing a baby coo or they're they're needing their mother or they're needing that affection from a caregiver, and mm. sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't. What we're talking about is is the long-term effects of that, of that attachment, not, not happening or that bond, not happening. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it can be the bonding. It, it, basically the, you, you go, your needs aren't met. Mm -hmm. and, and so what you learn is that inherently just as a being, that's not good enough. You're not enough. You're not enough. And, and, and that being inexperienced at, at being, in this world, you don't have a nuanced understanding of that as you do as an adult. So whatever, whatever meaning you attach to that as a child, you take that coping strategy with you, you take that meaning with you and that go follows you. It's with you as an adult and it's something you've never examined. And so you find yourself doing things that you know better than to do. But you can't help yourself. You just do that because you have that same old thing, that same old playbook running the same old plays that worked for you when you were three, that worked for you when you were seven, might have worked for you when you were a teenager, maybe in your 20s even. But here you are, you're 30, you're 40, you're 50, you're 60, mm -hmm. or even older. And you're like, this isn't working. I'm not getting what I want out of the world. And... Right. If you have any sort of self-awareness, you, you you wake up and you're like, this can't be everybody around me. Maybe that's something about me. Yes. And at, at which point, maybe right. you go into therapy. Maybe you continue to struggle. Maybe you try something different. Or maybe you do all of the above. Um, you know, it, it, it depends. And, and so for me, it didn't bring me into therapy. I did that when I was in, in school. I didn't find it helpful rehashing the old hurts. Eh. But I, I found help with hypnosis and I found it so quickly that I decided I wanted to um, study it and, and become a hypnotist myself. And then, and then you know, what I've, is it about? Can you explain what it is about hypnosis? Yeah. I'm, I'm curious and I'm, I'm thinking maybe others might be too. What is it about being in a hypnotic state that you think helps people uh, unlock some of the narratives that they've told themselves from their past. Well, first, let me point out that a hypnotic state, we fall into hypnosis every single day. When you're watching TV, when you're reading a book, when you're watching a movie and everything else in the world, you just can't, can't touch because you're in the bubble. Or when you're driving and you're kind of in your own little world and you get to your destination and you don't remember anything that happened on the way. Yes. So, uh, you know, there, there's nothing unnatural about it. But what happens is we spend all this time in our conscious mind, right? And we have these great conversations with ourselves in our conscious mind. But it's what is going on in our subconscious that is driving the bus. That's where all the interesting stuff is. And when there's a conflict between your rational conscious mind and your emotional 
subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is going to take over every single time. And that's why it's so powerful. That's why you do the things that you know better than to do. But you do it because you're triggered. You yep. lash out. You pick the Absolutely wrong person. Nancy. You choose the wrong foods. You decide not to go to the gym because not doing it is whatever your 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 mind is is reverting to old patterns where your mind is trying to keep you safe. So one of those things is going on. And that the subconscious is also where you 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 store these old stories that you formed about yourself when you were very young. I'm awesome. But most of us don't form that story about ourselves. Most of us form a story of some version of I'm not enough. What I want isn't available to me or some variation of the two of them together. Mm -hmm. And until we rewrite that story, until we understand that that story that we told ourselves simply isn't true because we have all this proof around us that tells us differently. Until we get that done and, and, and install a new story and remove the a negative emotional charge that may be going with that story, until we do that, we're not free of it. It, it. it can pop up at any time. And you will revert to old patterns because, boom, there's that trigger. Oops, it's making me feel something that I didn't like to feel. And this is how I used to cope with it. So even though I'm 40 years old, I'm going to have a temper tantrum like a three-year-old. And then afterwards, I'm going to beat myself mm -hmm. up about it because I'm like, yeah. why, why the hell did I do that? Well, that's why. Because your subconscious right. is working and off I, an old play. Nancy, do you think of it too? I mean, a lot of talk in the military right now, toughness and resilience. And one of the theories that I've had going on in my brain too is that if when growing up, you weren't given, I wouldn't say given a hard time, but you weren't guided to fall gracefully or to fail often to get better. Like take somebody, and, and I know this is an extreme example, who's had a lot of problems, but he's also had a lot of successes. Take, take Tiger Woods. He had this just father who just beat him down, beat him down, beat him down, beat him down. He's had a lot of problems because of that too. Don't get me mm -hmm. wrong. But he rose to these just and, and you can say that about anybody who's sort of a savant or who's become great at what they do. They just, they built up this toughness and this um, ability to withstand pressure and stress. And I, I care, I'm curious sometimes with people who, who really struggle with trauma, do you think part of it is because they haven't really learned to instill with them this resilience to, to tough situations or to stress? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, you got a lot to unpack there, Teresa. Um, so, so let me um, let, let me see what I can do with that. Okay, so for many of us, well, you not not many of us. I'm just going to say most of us. Okay, we're not rewarded for just being. Okay, we're we're kind of rewarded for that when we're babies because that's really all you can do. But we're mm -hmm. always praised for what we have done. We learn to walk. Yay! We get toilet trained. Yay! You know, we learn to tie our shoes. Yay! We learn the alphabet. Yay! We 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 scored the goal. We got the A. We got the scholarship. We got the job. We got the promotion. We found the spouse. We had the kids. We bought the house. We bought the car. We're we're rewarded for all those things. We're recognized for all of those things. But nobody recognizes when you take a step back to take a breath mm -hmm. to consider how far you've come and what you want to do next nobody's applauding that people think you just dropped off the face of the earth and well i'm not talking to you until you get your act together and whatever or they must have had some sort of mm -hmm. breakdown because you know, they're not participating in society as, as we all expect, you know, when, when you hop off the hamster wheel, people forget. But in the case of, of really super high achieving people, sometimes that's a trauma response. And, and keep in mind that, that, you know, not 
all traumas are big. Little traumas can be big and big traumas can be little. But what matters is how we respond to those traumas and the stories we tell ourselves about those traumas. So as a little kid, a little mm -hmm. trauma can be a big thing because you don't have the life experience to notch it down. Or a big thing can be a little thing because you just think, mm -hmm. well, that's how it is in every family. You know, and, and you just suck it up. Right. And, and, and so I'm not on this whole resilience bandwagon for, for that reason, because people's how, how people respond to different situations, that is what determines their level of resilience, not not the level of what they endured. So that's a great point. That is a great point, Nancy. And and that is something that I've always wondered about because you know you you have two people let's say that go into 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 war. I'll just use a military example, mm -hmm. and you know this person on the on this side, you know, fare through it just fine and may live their life fairly normal and have a happy life. And then this other person, um, it just really. Doesn't okay, Teresa, you've cut out and you're frozen again. All right, so so Teresa's cut out again, but I think what she's getting to is why do some people get shell shocked or PTSD, and others don't when they go to war? And, and quite simply, it, it, it's in what they, how they respond to that, what they tell themselves about that, and in how much of that they um, they bring into their bodies. Okay, so if you ever watch dogs at a dog park, get into it. Afterwards, they just shake it off. Well, that's the body's way of releasing the trauma. Okay, you go to war, it's high pressure. You, you do a lot of other things. It's a high pressure situation. But if you don't do something physically to shake it off, that's going to get stored somewhere in your body. And every time something that feels like that happens again, it, it, it's going to um, it's going to trigger that. It's going to bring that alive. I see Teresa's back again. So Teresa, I was just saying about how I think you were getting at the difference between why do some people get PTSD and some don't. And some of it right. is around the stories that we tell ourselves about what we've seen and what we've done. Also about our body's physical reaction. So if you've heard fight or flight, that is the body going into protection mode. And... If your body doesn't discharge that stress somehow, it gets stored in your body. And so any other thing that after that, if you're somebody who, who has a thing with, with gunfire or, or mortars and you hear fireworks, that is going to set you off. It's going to send you back to being in that bunker or in that situation you were in where you, when you mm -hmm. encountered that. And, and so you had to help your body release that. And, you know, it can be like shaking it off in the, in the motion or in the moment. Um, there's a technique called havening that helps you uh, shake it off. So there's somatic, um, different somatic therapies that you can do to help with that. But, but the key there is, is really not to keep talking about it, but to do something to release where it's stored in your body. And, and so that, that that's a two part answer. That mm -hmm. So so there's a mental aspect of that. And then there's a physical aspect to that, because there's a whole bunch of neurochemical things that are going on when you are in um, a fight or flight situation. 
Gotcha. Uh, we did have some couple, just a couple, que one question here. And I don't think you, I don't know if you followed the case and some, um, somebody did ask Sherry Rogers bird says, what's your take on the Amber Heard? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, Johnny Depp thing. And you know what? I really didn't follow I, it I that much. Do my best. <laughs> I don't know if you followed. I didn't follow it that much at all. Yeah. And, you know, it, it just seemed to me as it, someone who just kind of, followed it at the very tops of the waves. Um, he said versus she, she said, which a lot of these things are. Um, yeah. and, and somebody was, was clearly, well. And in, in an aggressor. There was definitely, in my yeah, There opinion, was an aggressor and there was somebody who was just trying to survive. And so I'm watching and, the and, trial. I believe that Amber Heard was the aggressor. But. And, and, and you know what? I, I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb and maybe say something a little unpopular. All right. Aggressors aren't born. Right. Is there something in her background, too, that made Absolutely. her think that this was the strategy and this is how you behave in a relationship? And she didn't know any better. Does, no. Doesn't make it right. No. But it, it, it makes her a different kind of victim. Um, it, you know, I, I believe victim. that they fed off of each other. Yeah. And, and and then there's that because because you can get into these, oh, what do they call them? Oh. There's a name for it, but it's it, it's a dynamic and victim perpetrator dynamics and and it's ugly, you know. And, and as we saw in that trial, yeah, sure, the judge declared somebody a winner, but was there a winner? I don't I don't think that there was a winner. No. Because neither of them, I think that the the help they need. Right. I I think though though Nancy the good the only good takeaway from that case was that it allowed people to understand that men can be victims too. Mm -hmm. And in this case, there there definitely were there definitely seemed to be more of a of a uh, side of Johnny Depp being a victim and Amber Heard being more the aggressor. But I do believe that they fed off of one another and they were unhealthy for one another for a lot of years. And we just saw playing out on a national stage, a lot of trauma and a lot of unfortunate mm -hmm. behavior. And I think the reason that the case galvanized so many people is because we have a lot of, a lot of people could see somebody that they knew in mm -hmm. the behaviors of those two people. And so it, it wasn't, it, you know, take away the salaciousness, take away the stupid TikTok memes and all the funny stuff. I really do believe that the case held a lot of significance. I, hmm. you know, I do. Of, I believe it had a lot of significance for mainstream media versus social media influencers and, and other issues as well. Well, in, in my training, one of the things I learned is that hurt people hurt people. So when you see someone being aggressive, um, victimizing others, you know, I, I, I kind of liken it back when I was in grade school, I was bullied by this short little scrawny kid, no less, right? And um, back then I, I just didn't know what to do with it. it. It didn't occur to me that people would be like that to other people. How, how could people, I, I had never seen it before. You know, I was right. nine years old, never seen anybody do that before. Um, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm a victim of it. But, but knowing what I know now, this kid may have been bullied himself, maybe not at school, but at home. And he was just acting out what had been done to him. Mm hmm and well, I can't go back and give him a hug now because, you know, neither of us are going to be eight years old again. Um, I, I try to keep that in mind when I see people lashing out inappropriately that that this isn't something they were born with. This this something it, it, it's not what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you. What happened mm -hmm. to you? Right. And. Some sometimes what happened to you? You were so young, you don't you know. Remember. I think I agree. I agree to that to a point, but where does the line come when you're working with a bully or you're 
to have somebody in your life who's abusive and you have to stand up for yourself versus having compassion for them? How do you draw that line? Well, I, I think you can have compassion for someone and still stand up for yourself. I, I, I think there, there is a way to do that, but it's not anything that any of us are ever taught. And it, you know, it, it's not easy to do. I, I would say the first step there is boundaries. Because sometimes mm -hmm. people don't right, understand the effect that they have on others. And, and you know, a, a lot of therapists will teach you, don't say you always, you never. But when you do this, I feel that. And, and sometimes it, it's a matter mm -hmm. of bringing attention to it. Most cases, no. Um, and sometimes you have to set up boundaries to protect yourself. Look, if you're going to talk to me that way, we're not going to interact. That's kind of tough mm -hmm. to do at work, but yeah, you know, you can you can get a new job. Yep, and you can you can get a new job that 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 isn't off the table. You don't have to um, put up with that. You you can take it up with the individual, and if they're not receptive. You can take it up the chain of command in military parlance to their boss. Hey, so-and-so is doing this and has a pattern of this kind of behavior. And if I don't get moved off this team or this isn't addressed, I'm going to vote with my feet and go somewhere else. Right. And, and, and people who are in the military, a lot of us don't necessarily, we can't quit our job. And so a lot of times we are forced uh, to, conf to, to work sometimes with people who, who may, may not be so kind. And uh, mm -hmm. one of my strategies, uh, you know, I don't make eye contact with them. I don't talk to them. I don't acknowledge them. And, and some people think that that's, that's me showing weakness, but, but really it's, it depends on the situation. I mean, I obviously can't do that with a boss or with somebody who's working directly for me, but um, yeah, I'm just, I'm not going to, of subject myself to somebody who speaks to me in an abusive manner and gets a pass for it. Um, sometimes I wish that it was the type of behavior that other people could see. But unfortunately, a lot of times with bullies is they act one way towards mm -hmm. everyone else in the group. And then they treat you, the person that they're targeting in a different way to where people aren't, aren't aware of, of the behavior that's going on. And so that's where I think that bullying and, 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 you know, mental abuse is so insidious because mm -hmm. it's often done out of earshot, out of eye shot. It's done mm -hmm. with a very, very subtle tone. And it's done in a way that's very exclusive, but not. And so I think that it's something that is so hard to deal with in the workplace because mm -hmm. of the fact that it's not somebody breaking a rule. They're not violating an ethic. They're not ethics. They're not, they're not doing something sometimes that you can go, oh my gosh, they broke this rule. No, they're just being abusive. And so mm -hmm. for me, my strategy, and it may not be the healthiest strategy, was just to avoid these people. Well, I mean, it, it, it's a strategy. Don't say right? good morning. Don't say hi. Don't even acknowledge them. Yeah. It, it, it's a strategy, but I think in the long run, that kind of strategy sets you up for other effects that you may not want, like people thinking that you're arrogant, okay, mm -hmm. or, or think people thinking that you're unapproachable. Um, yeah, or I'm weak because I don't stand up. Or, or that you're weak. And, and, and the mm -hmm. thing is, is, all right, some things that you always need to do. Know your worth. Know your value. Know what you bring to the table. And walk in with unshakable confidence because bullies are looking for people who don't have confidence. They're looking for people they can prey upon. And, and so if, if you are seeming like you're questioning your value, like, or you're putting off vibes, I don't belong here. Um, or feeling the effects of imposter syndrome. Everybody's going to find out. I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, guess what? The bully's afraid of that too. Okay. So what, what a, a better approach is 
again, having your boundaries. Don't speak to me that way. If you call me this, I will not respond. Right. And, and this is taking another page out of the parenting mm -hmm. handbook, right? Praise and acknowledge the behavior that's acceptable. And ignore the behavior that isn't. Yep. Doesn't always work. But, you know, you get, you know, my mom always used to say, you, you, you get more bees with honey or attract more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. So she would always be super sweet and nice to everybody because she, you know, she wanted people to come around and, and hang out and, and, and be comfortable in her presence. Um, doesn't mean that she liked all those people. Doesn't mean she agreed with what, what they behave, you know, what they did or didn't do. But that was, that was her kind of strategy to, to deal with people to kill them with kindness. Again, easier said than done in some cases. But don't confuse kindness with being nice because they're different. Sometimes mm -hmm. being kind means having a direct conversation and bringing things to people's attention that should be brought to their attention because honestly, yep. they might not know. They might yep. not realize might they've offended you. Whereas nice would be just whatever, taking it, letting it roll. You know, but when you let things go unchecked, it can become a problem. It can create a toxic workplace. And, and in some cases, in cases of sexual predators, it can put you in danger of being their next victim. Absolutely. I agree. And it's something that there are ways about going about being direct and about addressing the behavior uh, like you said, when you did this, I felt this and, and taking the person, pulling the person aside, giving them an opportunity to talk it out. If the behavior continues, you politely call them out publicly. And I've seen ways of ways that you can do that, mm -hmm. um, that are more direct. And then if those two methods fail, well, well, you have, you have no other choice, but to take it up to your supervisors mm -hmm. and your chain of command at that point. And then like you said, if all else fails and, and you're in a position where you can leave or at least switch departments or go to another mm -hmm. part of your organization, um, do so because your mental health is worth that. And I think that I'm very grateful that I've had those opportunities in the military when an environment wasn't healthy. I was able to move or I was able to find something that was a better fit. Um, getting back to the services that you offer with the hypnosis, what would you say are some of the things that you do with clients uh, to, to change that story with, with not just hypnosis, but just with your work um, revolving around what they've told themselves and, and how did you go about doing that? Well, I, I mean, you, you've known me for a long time, Teresa, and, and I've kind of always done this with you, whether you've realized right. or not. Um, you might now, but when we first met, you didn't. I do. <laughs> but I listen to people. I hear what they're saying, but I also hear what they're not saying. You know, they talk about reading between the lines. I listen between the lines, between what's being said and what's not being said. Um, cause sometimes what we don't say is really more impactful than what we do. And, and sometimes we don't realize that, that we're hiding these things from ourselves or that we're telling ourselves a story that doesn't serve our, serve what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll use the case of imposter syndrome because I think we all can, uh, identify with being thrown in the deep end of the pool with no support. Well, they're not going to throw you in the deep end of the pool unless they think you can swim. Or they really want you to drown. Um, so you get thrown in the deep end of the pool. You, you feel overwhelmed. And you tell yourself these stories, okay? What's the difference between the person who drowns and the person who swims? Is it because I can actually swim? Not always. You just have to be able to tread water. I learned that. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, you know, and, and, and so if you tell yourself, I can keep treading water.
you'll keep treading water. And in fact, I, I was reading about this just the other day, an experiment with rats. They put them somewhere, basically left them where they had to tread water, right? And they're treading water for like 15 minutes. Well, they pull them out after 15 minutes. You let them rest and then they put them back in. And then they left them there for like hours and hours. And if, if they hadn't have been pulled out, they would have drowned because they would have just gave up. But the rats in this experiment persevered because they thought they were going to get rescued again. So they just kept telling themselves, I just need to tread water just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer. Help is coming. Help is coming. So they're telling themselves a story that helps them get through the situation rather than, oh, no, help's never coming. Nobody's going to rescue me. Mm -hmm. I may as well just give up and drown. Right. And, and, and so there, there's, that's a big aspect. And, and sometimes recognizing this stuff consciously is enough. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's great if it is, but sometimes you don't recognize that that story is, is, is deeper in your subconscious and that you're telling yourself that you don't. I mean, um, a common one is, um, overweight, you know, I want to be thin. I'm doing everything I can. Right, well, maybe you are, maybe you're not. But maybe your subconscious mind is keeping you safe from something you don't want. Hmm. And maybe, it's fascinating. And, and maybe you maybe you can't see that. And maybe you need help seeing that. And I, I help people see that, you know, consciously, subconsciously. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you've seen on TV and in movies about hypnosis, where people are just implanting suggestions. I, that's part of it, but I do so much more. I, I, I have conversations with people. Hypnosis is just a, a doorway to that, that part of you that doesn't get a voice that you can't articulate. It's there and it'll come up and act up, but it's not, um, it doesn't have words most of the time. And, and so I just use hypnosis. We swing that door open. We have a conversation. Oh, this is why you're doing that. Okay. We talk about it in the subconscious. Subconscious realizes, okay, yeah, this isn't serving me. I, you know, I really am awesome or, or whatever it takes to change the conversation to get you moving in the direction you want to get. Um, you know, we basically align your conscious thoughts and desires with your unconscious, subconscious thoughts and desires. And then we close the door back and you go back about your business. Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it, it's, 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 so you start, you talked the other day. Oh, I'm sorry. I think our delay is getting in the way, but I was just going to say, you talked the other day about heart healing. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about what that is? Yeah. So, so that's um, something that, again, it, it uses hypnosis as a way to open the door. And it's a very powerful technique where we do some guided imagery um, to take you back without reliving an experience, but to where something was created and then um, having you feel those feelings, voice those, what you needed to voice at that time and you couldn't. And, and, and then we go in and, and we talk about, you know, create those, those new positive suggestions. And guess what? You get to choose them. I have some, some good stock ones, but if, if you have something specific that you want to say, your words are going to be more powerful than anything I come up with. And then we'll, we'll close the door and, and, and then you have this new story to tell yourself. Not that I, I can't do it, but yes, I can. And here's how, and here's why I'm super resourceful. I've overcome this, that, and the other thing. Mm-hmm. It's powerful. It's so powerful, Nancy. Mm -hmm. And I think that one good. So I was just saying that I think that when you get in touch with that person that you were. And then you start to have this whole new or whatever you want to call it, like 
that person that was curious and was 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 you growing up and 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 then you just have this completely different relationship with your past mm -hmm. well yeah I, I mean that that that's really important because like i said when, when you come into this world when you're born you have tons of confidence because you haven't had anybody right. tell you any, any different and right you know as you grow up and you're you know you're you know maybe you you your parents are of the school of children should be seen and not heard. Well, then you learn to be less of yourself or that you can't be as exuberant as you want to be in certain situations because it's not socially appropriate. Well, when you're a little person, you don't know that it's not about you, that, that it, you know, that, that, that it's not about your, mm -hmm. you expressing yourself, but it's about you expressing yourself at that particular time. And, and so you just internalize, Oh, I can't express myself. There's something wrong with me. I'm mm -hmm. not acceptable. And, and you just continue to carry that with you in, in, until you change your relationship with, with that. And, but once you do, it opens up so many fascinating doors for you. And, and, and in your level of happiness increases, your confidence increases. You find you can do things that you never thought you could do because you've reframed what you think your capabilities are and it, it just changes everything and Teresa's stuck again there she is there i am I do apologize. I, I can do about it, though. Unfortunately, guys, I don't have the hard line anymore uh, computer since we've moved. So I'm only on the Wi-Fi. And unfortunately, we just had mm. a storm. So what I would probably do, or, can you, OK, Nancy? Mm -hmm. Awesome. I, I think as we as we wrap up and uh, I will see what we can do to, to try to because this is such a fascinating conversation and I and I do apologize. I, I, I'm going to go back and re-listen. Hopefully, our, the, the viewers and the audience can still hear you perfectly. And if they can, then I'll be able to just upload this uh, no problem to audio. But if people want to get in touch with you and they want to know more about your work and they want to learn more about heart healing or hypnosis, um, what's what's the best way they can get in touch with you? Um, you know, to, to start with, I just literally today finally launched my new blog on Substack, um, Heal the Leader at Substack.com. And yep. it looks like Teresa's that got that in the cool. banner on the bottom. Thank you, Teresa. Um, You're welcome. And, and in this space, I'm just going to be talking about all these, these different things because, you know, from my experience in corporate America, from my experience in the military and working with government clients, what I learned about changing organizations, about being a more effective leader was you got to do all this stuff outside of you change this program, change that program, blah, blah, blah. And, and what I found through my personal exploration is going in within and really getting to know yourself. That really changes everything because you change your relationship to those memories, to those things that you believed one thing, something else. Like here's another great example. You go to daycare. Mom's leaving me. Mom doesn't love me. I'm not lovable. Really? Mom's going to work so that she can get the money to pay the things that you need. Right. I love you very much, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe you don't know that. And, right. and once you reframe that relationship with that stuff, then you can really be who you are meant to Absolutely. be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and so... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be exploring all that stuff. So bringing that back to the leaders. bring If we all spent as much time focused on understanding and changing ourselves as we do with tinkering around changing everything else on our teams and in our organizations. So we have something to put on our performance evaluations because we're rewarded for doing, not being. Um work would be a much different experience for all of us. 
families Absolutely. will be a much different experience for all of us. You know, it, we, we, we might actually enjoy things that we often drag down. You know, last time I was back in Ohio, not this time, but the time before, I took time to go to my grade school, my high school. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of visiting with some of my old girlfriends growing up. And I had a completely different story in my head about my childhood and about what had happened and, and sort of situations with the bullying and everything. And I sort of made my peace with everything. And I realized that, yes, I, I had struggles, but they weren't everything. There was also a lot of good memories and there was a lot of fun times. And the story that I had told myself all through my, my twenties was and thirties was poor me. Oh, I had it so hard. And I, and I created almost like a victim story in my head about what had happened growing up. And yeah, I had hard times and, and yeah, it wasn't always easy, but I also had some really good times and I had some really good people in my corner and I had some really good family around me. And having had that experience and reimagine, I wouldn't say reimagining or just retelling that story and that narrative differently mm -hmm. was really good for me. And so um, I would highly recommend that, that people do that and start to look at their childhood and look at the parts of their childhood that were wonderful. Even if they have an abusive past, mm -hmm. uh, there's always those, those wonderful people, whether that's be a girlfriend's mother or mm -hmm. uh, your best friend that you hung out with all the time or a teacher at your school or whatever, try to remember what those memories were like. And it can really just have such a cathartic effect. So, um, Nancy, I just want to thank you so much. You know, you and I have been such close friends over the years. And as I've grown in my journey and, and started to, to understand my past more and, and kind of retool what my narrative was, uh, you've been there every step of the way. And I want to thank you for that. Well, and thanks again for having me on, on the show. Um, I really appreciate it. And I want to just add one little bit to what, what you were just saying, you know, about the victim mentality. Be the victor, not the victim, because everybody can be the hero of their own story. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm going to meet you backstage. I apologize, you guys, for all the technical difficulties. I'll go back and re-listen to this, and hopefully I can I can salvage this for the audio upload. But thanks for the patience uh, putting up with me. Hopefully it was just me in and out uh, and not you guys not hearing uh, her good sound. But um, I'm always in such a peaceful and blissful state after I talk to you. So thank you so much. And uh, like I said, guys, uh, please go to her uh, website, What If Transformation LLC. Um, I'll, I'll also link to her Substack. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Nancy. Oh, I was going to say, it's actually whatiftransformation.com. Oh, sorry. That's okay.
All right, guys, I am now going to try to get off the call again. It looks like I'm <laughs> gosh, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> well, now I'm back out on the call again. I hope you guys have an amazing evening. We'll say goodbye to Nancy here. And uh, I'm going to go to a full screen and uh, thank you all for your patience with me and uh, probably be my last podcast for a little while. I'm uh, headed to England on Monday, so it'll take me some time to set up over there and figure out the internet and all that good stuff. But thank you all for watching. Have an amazing evening and good night.